Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College online journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Colonel J.P. Clark, an Army War College professor in the Department of Military Strategy, Planning, and Operations, and the Editor-in-Chief of War Room. Thanks for joining us for what will no doubt be a fascinating discussion with Mr. Ali Wine, who is, among other things, a senior analyst at Eurasia Group, a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a David Rockefeller Fellow with the Trilateral Commission, and a security fellow with the Truman National Security Project. More generally, I find Ali to be consistently one of the most insightful, nuanced, and interesting voices on national security and geopolitics. I read everything he writes, and I recommend that you do as well. So with that, welcome to the War Room, Ali Wine. Colonel Clark, uh, what an honor, what a privilege to be engaging with you. And I, I do feel, I know we're going to dive into the, the substantive conversation in a little bit, but I, I do have to digress somewhat personally, just for the benefit of everyone listening. Uh, I feel like in a way, this conversation, it's particularly gratifying for me in terms of coming full circle. So we had a conversation when I was in the very nascent stages of writing the book and your insight, well, first of all, you were, you know, there were so many demands on your time. So you carved out time to to speak with me and to share your insights when I was in that beginning stage, uh, in the beginning stages of writing the book. And your insights were incredibly uh, illuminating for me. They really helped to structure the book. And so, to have spoken with you when I was at the very uh, in the very preliminary stages of writing the book, and to now be having a follow up conversation with you now that the, that the book is out in the world, it's it's very gratifying. And so, just by way of a, a personal note, a, a real honor and privilege for me to be speaking with you. Well, that's very kind of you, and uh, I will uh, make sure that the Venmo comes over your way here in a few minutes uh, for uh, anybody who's listening. But you know that 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 leads into a a nice you know sort of start to this. And all I should say, so congratulations on the re- the release of America's Great Power Opportunity. Um, yeah, I apologize to to you and our listeners that there, we can't possibly do justice uh, to such a nuanced you know kind of examination of of the uh, the world j- stage and in, in just thirty or thirty five minutes or so. But I, I think that you know where you were, you started going there is let, let's just discuss the intellectual journey that brought you from that start point to publication you know last month. Sure. So I, I began writing the book in earnest, I would say in, in late late 2019. And just in terms of the, the broader backdrop, obviously, you have uh, the publication of two very seminal documents from uh, the previous administration. So the Trump administration releases its national security strategy in December of 2017. And then the Department of Defense releases its national defense strategy a month later in January 2018. And both documents really bring to the fore this, this concept or construct or, or framework, really, of great power competition. Now, uh, I don't want to suggest that great power competition prior to the publication of those two documents had been uh, dwelling in obscurity. It certainly had been gaining traction. And I think particularly with Russia's incursion into Ukraine and its subsequent annexation of Crimea in 2014, with China's kind of slow drip, steady campaign of land reclamation of the South China Sea, So the term had certainly been getting attention Uh, in the government, I think, particularly in the Department of Defense, it had been gaining some traction. But prior to the release of those two documents, um, I would argue that great power competition, um, it hadn't diffused across the broader interagency. Uh, And it certainly hadn't achieved an escape velocity whereby it it was sort of a mainstream, uh, a a component of mainstream discourse. I think that with the publication of those two documents, it really did achieve that escape velocity so that it not only had diffused, it was not only diffusing broadly across the interagency, but also it was really informing uh, just much broader conversations, uh, scholarly conversations, analytical conversations, uh, popular commentary. And so as someone who's interested in U.S. foreign policy, interested in geopolitics, world affairs, I said to myself, well, I better get a handle on this term that seems to be, not seems to be, it was, uh, it had rapidly become so ubiquitous. I said, I better get a handle on this term if I want to be able to maybe not contribute to the conversation, but at least understand the conversation that's taking place. And what I discovered in the course of of writing the book, and and I I try to make this point in the book, um, 
there was a gap between the ubiquity of the term on the one hand, and again, important to note, not just ubiquity in, in government conversations, but ubiquity in just the broader sort of national conversation. There was a gap that I discovered between the ubiquity of the term on the one hand and the underspecification of the term on the other hand. And so when I would ask individuals in, in for the purposes of researching the book, when I would ask individuals, well, wh- what, how would you define great power competition? What does it mean for U.S. foreign policy? I think sort of at a bird's eye view, maybe at a 30,000 foot view, there was a fair bit of agreement. So most observers, most observers will argue that great power competition refers to a relative diminution in U.S. influence, at least vis-a-vis America's position at the end of the Cold War or at the turn of the century, uh, and also implies a relative ascendance or a, a, re- a relative gain in influence for America's two principal nation state competitors, namely China and Russia. So at the descriptive level, there's a, a broad sense of what great power competition means. Uh, but then when you ask, what are the implications of that diagnosis for U.S. foreign policy? Uh, one, you get a lot of disagreements over what exactly is the United States competing over? What exactly is the United States competing for? And what I found is that as time has progressed since the release of those two documents, the 2017 NSS and the 2018 NDS, uh, NDS rather, what I've What I found is that in the intervening years, even though there are disagreements over the implications of great power competition for U.S. foreign policy, at least in in my in my understanding, based on what I've been reading, based on the conversations I've been having, the prevalent interpretations have grown more encompassing in the interregnum. They've grown more all encompassing such that now and, and maybe I'll stop here. Such that now I think it's quite common when you ask observers, well, what does great power competition imply for U.S. foreign policy? You very often will hear. Great power competition means that the United States is engaged in a long-term, indefinite, protracted, uh, multidimensional, globe-spanning competition with China and Russia in, in particular to determine nothing less than the contours of world order. Now, you may agree with that assessment. That assessment may be true, and it's undoubtedly the case that competition is intensifying with those two countries across the world. The trouble that I have with, with, with that characterization is, because it's so broad, really to the point of being maximalist, it doesn't so much tell you it. It doesn't so much tell you uh, what to do. The real question is, what does it tell you not to do? And of course, the essence of strategy, and, and Colonel Clark, you would know better than than anybody else. You know, the essence of strategy is trade offs. The essence of strategy is a recognition that even for the world's preeminent power, the world's lone superpower, um, to recognize the imperative of choice. And if you accept. Uh, and a steadily more encompassing, perhaps even maximalist conception that either discounts the existence of trade-offs or ignores them altogether, I fear that even though the world's lone superpower has greater runway to ignore those choices, at a certain point, the realities of power or the, the prerogatives of power and the realities of strategy are eventually going to come to clash. Yeah, thank you for that. That's uh, yeah, it, it, and something that struck me as, as you were just going over that is the degree to which, you know, you said, the, you know, great power competition in kind of its current guise is, is tied to a very specific document, um, you know, that is associated with the Trump administration. Uh, and, you know, as people who, who, you know, we, we, we write and we deal with documents for a living, we always like to say that, you know, words matter. Although there's an interesting element where in some ways they, they don't seem to matter and in some ways they do in, in a, on a couple of different levels. And so the fact that we have a lot of people who are signing on to great power competition, does the phrase really have meaning of its own or is it simply just expansive enough that multiple worldviews can kind of see themselves in it? And so we're, you know, a different different, you know, policy prescriptions, you know, uh, separated by a common lexicon. But at, at the, the same point, it seems to be very Im- important. And as you said, that, you know, there are some, some central tenets that everybody seems to agree upon. And so what is the relationship between words and actions? And uh, when one thing I would throw out, and unfortunately, we don't have time to go through, you know, the uh, you know, one of you, I, the, the, a chapter that's worth the price of the book alone is your your comparisons uh, with you know 1930s and the Cold War, both of which are very popular you know analogies that our people are using. And and you say that yes, there are some some similarities, but there's also some differences. And so this seems to be to harken back, and, and at least here's a similarity: containment 
was a very expansive idea that a lot of different worldviews, a lot of different decision, you know, diverging decisions could have been made under the same, uh, you know, header. So what's the relationships between, for lack of a better word, buzzwords and the way that America actually goes out and acts in the world? What's, what's your thoughts on that? Words are critical. Words are words, phrases, buzzwords. And I will say that one of the virtues of great power competition, and it really is a credit to the, the intellectual architects of great power competition, is that in a very pithy way, and it, this gets back to my distinction between description and prescription. So even though in the book, I do set forth a critique of great power competition as a prescriptive framework, uh, descriptively, it does distill a very important set of dynamics animating contemporary geopolitics. So as we were discussing just a few minutes earlier, it's undeniably the case that the United States today is relatively not as preeminent as it was at the turn uh, or at the end of the Cold War or at the turn of the century. It's undeniably the case that its two principal nation state competitors, namely a resurgent China and an irredentist Russia, are more able and more willing to contest U.S. influence, more able and more willing to challenge certain aspects of uh, the U.S. led, uh, predominantly U.S. led post war order. So great power competition, it has, it has the virtue of brevity. Uh, it has the virtue of distilling very important dynamics that are driving or very important drivers of geopolitics. I think it also has a certain bureaucratic virtue. Uh, and I think that in this interregnum between the say, the end of the Cold War and perhaps you could say 2014 or 2015, um, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States kind of won a Pyrrhic victory. On the one hand, it lost uh, its I shouldn't say it lost. It eliminated its existential adversary because the Soviet Union imploded in such dramatic fashion. But it also lost its principal ballast that had steered its foreign policy uh, for the better part of half a century. Now, as you said, containment was certainly implemented differently by different administrations, no question about it. But it provided a broad umbrella that guided U.S. foreign policy for the better part of half a century. And then with the dissolution of the Soviet Union and and even going back a little bit further, I mean, U.S. foreign policy, and this is a point that George Kennan makes, uh, or that George Kennan made, if you go back even before America's confrontation with the Soviet Union, you look at its, uh, its encounters or its confrontations with Nazi Germany, with imperialist Japan. So really, we're talking about a time frame of about 60 years that U.S. foreign policy has been not, not exclusively, but quite preoccupied with meeting and, and dealing with and managing external competitors. And now, and Kennan warned, I think, in a very uh, far-sighted way in the early 1990s, he says there's a risk now that U.S. foreign policy is going to it's going to succumb to disorientation absent this uh, this ballast. And so, I think that what great power competition does, it reflects on the one hand strategic anxiety because obviously you see that you see these shifts in the global balance of power, but there's a sense that aha, whew, in a bureaucratic sense, breathing a sigh of relief that we at least in principle have a playbook that we can resume. We've dealt with major external competitors before. External competitors have disciplined U.S. foreign policy before. They have been a spur to internal renewal. Uh, if you look at scientific and technological innovation, they have provided a measure, uh, not a full measure, but a partial measure of cohesion among, uh, the, uh, among the American people. And so I think that there's a sense that perhaps in dealing with China and Russia, we can resume that familiar playbook. So. Uh, I think that as a as a phrase, as a construct, as a descriptive framework, it has a lot of virtues, and I think that it 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 captures salient dynamics in the international system. It puts us in mind uh, to resume a familiar playbook, even though I think that there are going to be critical differences in how the United States competes today versus how it's competed in the past. But it has it has a lot of virtues. Um, just one point that I will, one uh, last point that I wanted to make on kind of the comparison between containment and great power competition and the way in which uh, words and phrases, uh, when they have sort of an inbuilt elasticity, how they can come to uh, incorporate very, very different or yield very different policy prescriptions. Containment is very interesting in this regard. So when Kennan, pro when Kennan articulates containment and he writes about this this frustration of his in his 1967 memoir, Kennan says, when I articulated containment, I specifically said that containment should apply to five, to five geographic theaters, one of them being the Soviet Union. But he said that outside of the Soviet Union, I, meaning George Kennan, 
uh, I assessed that there were four geographic theaters outside of the Soviet Union that I believed were capable of industrial scale military mobilization. And so when I articulated containment, I said that the objective of U.S. foreign policy under the guise of containment should be to ensure that those four geographic theaters outside the Soviet Union don't fall under communist dominion. And he grew concerned because even though his, his doctrine of containment gained widespread bipartisan acceptance, uh, the individuals who subsequently implemented it adopted much more a much more expansive conception of containment that really did blur, if not outright collapse, the demarcation between the core of the post-war order and the periphery of the post-war order. Um, and I think that similarly with, you know, with great power competition, we're seeing that it's undergoing this steady metamorphosis comparable to the metamorphosis that containment underwent, such that it's now becoming, assuming much more maximalist tones. Uh, one last point, I promise, and then I'll stop. Um, uh, in terms of elastic, in terms of sort of intrinsically elastic terms that can come to capture or, or give rise to uh, policy prescriptions that are either in tension or in some cases are outright antithetical to one another, I think a very good example of, of this tension with great power competition, look at some of the reactions to America's withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan uh, this, past, uh, this past fall. Uh, obviously, a, uh, a contentious decision. There were very strong, I shouldn't say there were, there are very strong proponents of that decision. There are very strong opponents of that decision. A very interesting through line between advocacy for that decision and, and critiques of that decision, they both come back to great power competition. What do I mean? Proponents of the withdrawal from Afghanistan said that the United States has invested too much uh, too much time, too much effort, too many resources in counterterrorism. It's gone on a two-decade strategic detour in the Middle East, and that detour has allowed our principal nation-state competitors, namely China and Russia, to make inroads, to strengthen their comprehensive or to grow their comprehensive national power at America's expense. Now that the United States is exiting its longest war, it will be able to train its sights much more squarely on its competitors. So advocates of withdrawing from Afghanistan said, invoke great power competition, but so did opponents. Opponents said, if you withdraw from Afghanistan, you're going to allow your principal competitors to make greater inroads, not only in Afghanistan, but in, in Central Asia, in the Middle East, and you send a concerning signal to your allies and partners that you cut and run, you withdraw precipitously, you don't honor your commitments. And so opponents of America's withdrawal from Afghanistan, they too invoked great power competition and said that by withdrawing from Afghanistan, you have given our principal nation state competitors greater freedom of maneuver in Central Asia and the Middle East. And so think of, I mean, again, just to, to, to summarize and then I'll stop. So you have fierce, the, 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 the most, uh, the staunchest proponents of withdrawing from Afghanistan and the most vociferous opponents of withdrawing from Afghanistan, both invoking great power competition. Well, if you have a prescriptive framework that can simultaneously and credibly be used to justify withdrawing from Afghanistan and staying in Afghanistan, you do have to question its underlying analytical and therefore prescriptive utility. And I'm sure that there are other tensions uh, driving from the framework that we could get into. Oh yeah, thank you for that. And uh, and and to me, this actually seems like a really good example of the benefits of the descriptive aspect, which is you know you you talk about great power competition. Where and so if I could could summarize real quick that you know the 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 major elements that everybody seems to agree upon is that there is going to be an enduring competition because as you said, you know neither you know. Uh, the PRC or or Russia seems to be about ready to implode and and just kind of you know leave the uh, leave the stage, and so there's going to be some sort of long you know ongoing uh, element where uh, the the United States does not have such a preponderance of of power that we can we can afford to be you know maximalist and and not make those strategic choices that you would, you would refer to, but I'd like you to to go in a little bit more into what you see the um, the dangers of great power competition as a prescription. But to, to tee that up, you had, you'd mentioned earlier in your response about anxiety. And I, I really liked, you know, you, in the book, you, you quote from Stanley Hoffman that, you know, superpowers just nat naturally have anxiety because, because they have global reach. They're able to imagine that every you know, every reverse anywhere and, and no matter how far and dark the corner of the world, you know, that it's, it's, it's a threat to their influence and credibility, if not, you know, their material. So, uh, what in, but you, you, you say in the book that, you know, really this kind of 
you know, the prescription of great power conflict leads us towards that, that, or at least feeds into that anxiety. And, uh, and so I'd like for you just to give a little bit more to the, the listeners about how that leads to maximalism and, 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 and avoiding hard strategic choices. Sure. So I think that I, I would set forth kind of three, three main critiques of great power competition as a policy framework. One is that I think that it orients U.S. foreign policy almost you know, by definition to be reactive as opposed to proactive. And, and of course, I, I hasten to note that you know, in the real world, inevitably, and, and again, you know, Colonel Clark, you, know, you, would, you would know better than anybody else, you know, in the real world, when you're working these problems uh, on the front lines, there is going to be a certain inbuilt element of your foreign policy that will be reactive because surprises happen, shocks to the international system occur. So look at uh, just just think about the past few years. We had the coronavirus pandemic. We have we had Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which is now morphing into a kind of a grinding war of attrition. And now, of course, we see this very concerning uh, uptick in, in uh, cross strait tensions. So life happens. Uh, shocks happen. And so, of course, you have to react. You can't be insouciant in the face of challenges and shocks and surprises that arise. Uh, but I do think that even recognizing that a substantial part of your foreign policy is, uh, by definition, going to be reactive, trying to carve out more, trying to carve out as much proactive room as possible. And I worry that a foreign policy that is principally oriented around responding to competitors seeds uh, seeds a certain freedom of maneuver it constrains our meaning america's it constrains our freedom of maneuver and i think that it gives china and russia undue influence over the direction of u.s foreign policy because we are in waiting mode what is china going to do what is russia going to do and then the united states will respond and so you already in a way um, are competing on terms that your competitors are dictating so that's one one concern the second concern, and this concern actually, I would say, paradoxically, is I, I think should come as a source of comfort, quiet comfort, not, not unalloyed comfort, but a source of quiet comfort for the United States. I think that the great power competition framework is, is a policy framework. I think it risks actually needlessly aggrandizing the much vaunted strategic acumen of our, our principal competitors. I think that in the immediate aftermath of the Cold War, the pendulum, I think a, there's a fair argument to be made that the pendulum swung too far in the direction of complacence. The United States was exhausted, at the same time relieved that it had finally won this nearly half century long struggle against the Soviet Union. And there was a sense that it had de- it had dealt a death blow to the various isms, communism, fascism, authoritarianism, totalitarianism, we could go on and on, uh, quite a, a, an extensive uh, inventory of isms. And the United States felt, understandably, that it had dealt a death blow to those various isms. And so there was a, a certain triumphalism that did suffuse a lot of commentary uh, and thinking in the 1990s. And there really wasn't a, a sense that China and Russia might one day come to pose the types of competitive challenges that they're posing today. Uh, so I think that if one error is complacence, I think that there's a risk, that the corollary uh, risk is uh, consternation. And I think the great power competition, while recognizing the gravity of the challenges that China and Russia uh, pose to the United States, I, I fear that it it inflates their strategic acumen. So again, I hasten to note China and Russia, I don't think, as we were just discussing a few minutes ago, I don't think that either one of them is primed for a dramatic Soviet style collapse for all of their myriad socioeconomic challenges at home, their increasingly contested external environments. Um, I think that both of them have proven uh, to be more adaptive than some uh, some observers would, would have uh, hoped and or imagined. Um, I think that they're gonna muddle through. Uh, they're going to be enduring c- competitors. Having said so, I think that both of them have taken steps in, in recent months and in recent years that belied their much vaunted strategic acumen. So begin begin with sort of I think the obvious the obvious example is Russia. Now, with its invasion of Ukraine, uh, no, Russia has not been consigned to pariah status. Uh, it is it's cultivating uh, greater relationships in broadly what's known as or what's referred to as the global south. It's strengthening its relationship with China. Um, it is, I think, blunting, at least for the time being, it's quite effectively blunting the effect of, of sanctions. And there's a kind of boomerang effect that sanctions have had. These sanctions, by virtue of um, by virtue of producing certain externalities, you look at disruptions to energy markets, you look at disruptions to, to food markets, the sanctions are having a kind of boomerang effect that's actually really, really straining the kind of 
a transatlantic unity that was so strong in the initial weeks after Russia's invasion and that you, you're beginning to see signs of duress in that coalition. And I think that as winter approaches, particularly in Europe, and as um, as the midterms approach in the United States, as winter approaches in Europe, and Europe has to contend with energy shortages, um, I think that we're going to see even more fissures in that coalition. So Russia's uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has undoubtedly created a lot of uh, strategic headaches for the United States. But uh, in affirming that it is an enduring power, in affirming that the United States can't just exclusively focus on China and the Asia Pacific, I think that in affirming its relevance, uh, it's done so, I think, at profound cost to its long-term strategic outlook. So let's just run through some of the consequences. As I just said a minute ago, Russia is yet more beholden to China than it was prior to its invasion of Ukraine. So long as Vladimir Putin is at the helm of Russia, it's difficult to conceive of any basis for even a minimal rapprochement between Russia and the West. Russia has also strained a number of critical relationships uh, in Asia. Its relationships with Japan and South Korea uh, are are now under significant strain. Uh, Even though Russia is presently blunting the impact of sanctions, I do think that over the medium to long term, those sanctions are going to begin to bite more and they're going to curtail Moscow's access to capital and technology that it will require for its long-term economic uh, development. So it seems to me that Russia, with its invasion of Ukraine, while affirming its relevance, while creating a whole host of headaches for the West in particular, um, if if the objective of strategy is uh, to strengthen your centrality in the international system, to, to lay a stronger foundation for building your strategic outlook, it seems to me that Russia has engaged in a, a really quite profound uh, act of strategic self-sabotage. Turn to China. Now, China certainly is it's not as risk tolerant as, as Russia, despite its, its very, very concerning provocations that we're seeing right now in, uh, in the Asia Pacific and across, on a cross-strait basis. Uh, China is not as risk tolerant. It's not as blundering as Russia, but it too, I think it's taking actions that have been quite uh, damaging to its long-term strategic outlook. So uh, if you look at China's relationships with major powers, I would say that with the exception of Russia, most of its major power relationships are either stagnating or declining. Its relationship with the United States is declining. The European Union is examining China now in a fundamentally different way. Uh, look at the new strategic concept the NATO just unveiled. Uh, speaking about China in, in, in referring to it in, with much stronger language. And then, of course, look at the Quad. Uh, the Quad, which prior to the coronavirus pandemic, it was seen as kind of limping along as one of these kind of geopolitical abstractions. It now is proceeding with clear momentum. And so even though China's economic centrality is growing, I think that its diplomatic stature among advanced industrial democracies is declining. Now, China as well, like Russia, is trying to cultivate greater uh, relationships in the global south. It's promulgating alternative concepts of, of order. Uh, Bonnie Lin and Zhu Blanchett have a very good essay in Foreign Affairs in which they talk about how China is trying to regain the offensive. So it's it's uh, advancing this uh, so-called global security initiative. It's trying to reinvigorate the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's trying to give new heft to the BRICS. Uh, it's expanding its relations in the global south. And yet, um, if you are... Uh, if you do have pretensions, let's say, and there is still a debate among scholars as to what China's long-term strategic objectives are, but let's, for argument's sake, let's stipulate the maximalist case. Let's assume that China not only wants to uh, displace the United States from the Asia Pacific, but that it wants to overtake the United States for global preeminence. You're not going to you're going to make it much harder for yourself to accomplish those objectives if you steadily estrange one advanced industrial democracy after another. And so, I think even leaving aside China's internal challenges, because of the way that China has comported itself in recent years, I think that there are real questions about whether China can achieve regional hegemony, let alone global, uh, pr- uh, let alone global dominance. So critique number two is we don't want to underestimate China and Russia's strategic acumen, but we don't want to inflate their strategic acumen either, because the more, the more that we believe, we mean the United States, the more we believe that they are indeed 10 feet tall, that they are immune from strategic hubris, that they are proceeding from carefully laid plans, that their entente is going to proceed from strength to strength. The more we adopt those views, the more, understandably, we would succumb to anxiety and adopt a reactive foreign policy. The third and final critique, and then I'll stop. Um, and this critique, you know, Colonel Clark, I, I, I have to confess this by way of a, a by way of a little bit of a personal digression. Uh, I wrote an afterword to the book shortly after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and I'm, I'm very grateful to my editor, even though we were bumping up against publication deadlines, that she very generously permitted me to write an afterword offering some initial uh, re- reflections on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, when you see 
when you see the just the the sheer wanton cruelty that Russia is uh, is inflicting upon Ukraine, when you see the coercion that China is the multifaceted coercion that China is deploying against Taiwan, the the deteriorating human rights landscapes in both countries, it's very unsavory. It's very uncomfortable. It's very stomach turning to even contemplate cooperation with China and Russia. So when I wrote the afterward to the book, I tried to imagine a scenario that I could defend analytically in which the United States solely in alignment with like-minded countries in, in Europe and Asia could advance its vital national interests and essentially could lock China and Russia away in strategic in a strategic closet and take away the key. I wanted to construct such a scenario. I still want to believe that such a scenario is possible. I just couldn't convince myself that such a scenario exists. I just think that China and Russia, if you look at their aggregated resources, I just think that they're too large, uh, militarily, economically. Uh, and as much as we might want to think that they have been consigned to pariah status, I think that their relationships with advanced industrial democracies are indeed under tremendous strain, largely because of their competitive missteps. Uh, but they have many offsetting mechanisms. And so the third and final critique, as difficult as it is for me personally to articulate, is um, a framework that frames cooperative undertakings as fool's errands at best, and perhaps even as exhibitions of strategic weakness, is ultimately going to prevent the United States from achieving and making progress on its own vital national interests. When you think about the full panoply of transnational challenges, climate change, pandemic disease, uh, nuclear proliferation, so on and so forth, we have to find a way of preserving some baseline of cooperative interaction as as unsavory as that interaction might be, and recognizing, of course, that when we talk about diplomacy, engagement, interaction, those terms now kind of have pejorative connotations, but I think of them as being value neutral. Diplomacy to me simply means that you see the world as it is. You have to interact with a variety of countries, some of which you have very profound disagreements with, in order to advance your own interests. And I think that if the United States and the Soviet Union, given that they were existential adversaries, I think that if they were able to cooperate not only on arms control, but also on uh, polio vaccine research, it certainly should not today be beyond the reach of creative diplomacy to ensure that there is a baseline of cooperative space between today's great powers. Yeah, I thank you. And, and you know, something that came to mind is one of the, the nice lines, uh, and I think it was probably in the last chapter, and so uh, it was, was written before the afterward, because you might have modified it slightly, was that perhaps, you know, the greatest challenger to the United States is the United States, and the greatest challenger to, to China is China. And, and certainly, I think we can, you know, you made a very persuasive case that, uh, you know, Russia has already stepped into that, you know, problem with a, with a Pyrrhic victory. And, uh, or, or may not even a victory, but certainly, you know, um, uh, it was going to have some lasting, uh, you know, negative ramifications. And I think all this goes to underscore your point that actions that are taken reactively and out of a sense of fear tend to have costs, uh, you know, in the long term. And so for the final question, I would just ask you, because, you know, the, the title of the book is, you know, opportunity is in there. It actually is, is fairly optimistic. And so if you could just kind of briefly sum up for our listeners, okay, so we don't want to be reactive. We don't want to be maximalist. What, what should we be? And, and you have some very, you know, interesting and, and optimistic thoughts along those lines. So please. Sure. Um, well, I, I appreciate your, your giving me the chance to, you know, to close on the question. Um, I suppose it's, there's a two-part answer. One, I, I, I suspect that with the title, I am betraying my own just kind of congenital disposition. I, I am an optimist by, by nature. And so I do try to even, and especially in trying circumstances, I try to perceive opportunities, even though it, it might seem incongruous. And I mean, right now, if you look at uh, kind of the simultaneity of crises across three distinct theaters, we have we have a grinding war of attrition in Europe. We have a very dangerous escalation of uh, cross strait tensions in the Asia Pacific. And it seems as though the Iran nuclear deal, most observers believe that it's not going to be able to uh, be resuscitated. And so the potential for some kind of tinderbox in the Middle East. And so given the simultaneity of crises, very serious crises or potential crises in three distinct geographic theaters, it might seem incongruous to think of an opportunity, but I'm betraying my personal uh, disposition, number one. Uh, but number two, I think that there is an opportunity born both of uh, both of our competitors' competitive missteps, but also a profound, at this point, almost axiomatic recognition of how sort of ill-suited 
uh, the present order is for managing uh, transnational challenges, for managing great power frictions. I know it's become somewhat cliche to to think about are we at a present at the sort of a Dean Acheson present at the creation moment, uh, but even if that proposition is somewhat cliched, uh, I do think that it's I think that that cliche is is born in in, in a considerable measure of truth. So first, when you look at the coronavirus pandemic and how poorly the the order, the, the international system responded, when you think of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, when you see, and, and, and two very different challenges. We have a, a pandemic on the one hand, we have uh, an interstate you know, war on the other hand. Um, it's becoming, I shouldn't say becoming, it is now, if it wasn't before, it's now abundantly clear and self-evidently clear that today's kind of fraying, creaking, weakening order is increasingly ill-suited to purpose and that there is a need for maybe not an order that starts from scratch, but an order that is substantially refurbished, revitalized, reinvigorated. And the United States, even though its diplomatic network is is under siege from within and from without, uh, it's singular in scope and it's singular in dynamism. And I think that the United States does retain um, uh, a unique, really singular ability to mobilize coalitions. And so Whatever kind of order is going to be necessary to address great power frictions and address transnational challenges more effectively, uh, coalitions will be required. Um, in some cases, those coalitions will exist within existing, perhaps the, the core of Bretton Woods international institutions. In other cases, the United States and, and like-minded countries and also even competitors will have to be creative about forging ad hoc, more nimble dynamic arrangements outside those Bretton Woods institutions. So there is a necessity. We have to, we have to reinvent uh, the present order, or otherwise, we're going to be in, a, in I, I think, in for a period of very significant and sustained instability. There's also a set of circumstances that I think the United States might not, in, perhaps, might not even fully appreciate. Um, when your principal competitors score own goals and double down on those own goals, they give you a little bit of freedom of foreign policy maneuver. And so, you know, we discuss, we, we've been discussing that China, with its Kind of wolf warrior diplomacy, to use that expression, China has steadily estranged itself from the advanced industrial democracies with which it will need to preserve some baseline of trust if it wants to continue its resurgence. Russia, of course, has committed an act of self-sabotage with its invasion of Ukraine. And so when you recognize that, hey, my principal competitors, they're formidable, they're multifaceted, they're likely to endure, but they're not 10 feet tall, they're not immune from strategic hubris, they too make mistakes. And I think that hubris transcends ideology, it transcends ideology, it transcends regime type. Uh, I think that we need to say that, hey, how do we find a midway point between complacency on the one hand and consternation on the other hand? Their competitive missteps give us greater freedom of foreign policy maneuver. So what then is America's great power opportunity? Um, I think that the United States, really going back to the, the late 1930s, it is largely, not exclusively, but it's largely framed its foreign policy either around the existence of external challengers or the search for external challengers that might discipline its foreign policy. And what I try to suggest in my book is let's, let's weaken and maybe even see if we can break that tether that for too long has tied America's, that has tied U.S. foreign policy to the decisions of competitors or the search for competitors. And let's think about if we, if we were to conduct a thought experiment, articulating our purposes in the world and articulating our purposes at home without once invoking our competitors, how far would we be able to go in filling the blank? And I don't presume to have a great answer in the book. The book is really intended to be a conversation starter, but I really would exhort all of us uh, in, in the policymaking community and the analytical community to think about, given the need for a revitalized international system, Given the competitive missteps that China and Russia have made and, and, and seem to be doubling down on, I think that the United States has a really profound great power opportunity to think about an affirmative, proactive foreign policy that it's not tethered to, predicated upon the decisions of its competitors. And I think that if we find a way of seizing that great power opportunity, we will be able to steady our competitive perch, not only in response to China and Russia, but in response to whatever external competitors might arise in the future. We will project confidence, greater confidence for our allies and partners that we believe in our regenerative capacity, which has been the hallmark of, of, I would say, American exceptionalism. And I think that we'll have greater internal assurance, psychological assurance that no matter what competitive challenges China and Russia pose today, no matter what competitive challenges might arise going forward, that the United States will be able to meet them with, with equanimity, with poise, with clarity. And I think that that type of foreign policy will will steady America's competitive outlook externally, 
internally. We'll send good signals to allies and partners. We'll send encouraging signals to our to the American people. And so both out of a, my personal disposition, which is one of congenital optimism, but also out of a, a genuine sense that there is a really fertile moment because of the need for a reinvigorated order um, and the opportunity borne by competitive, competitive missteps of China and Russia. I think that that confluence, uh, that type of confluence doesn't uh, arise very often. I do think that genuinely the last time that confluence presented itself was in the immediate years after World War II. I do think that we are embarking upon another present at the creation uh, moment. And I think that it really behooves the United States to seize that opportunity. Well, that is a, a great way to end this conversation, uh, you know, for, for our listeners. And in the final chapter of the book, uh, Ollie lays out eight principles of, that kind of flesh that out a little bit more. But that, uh, you know, the, the, the basic tagline of, you know, let's do things based off of their own merits that we can justify in terms of a, 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 a positive outcome is, is probably a great place to start. And hopefully this, this indeed does start a, a good conversation along those lines. Uh, so thanks to you, uh, uh, Ollie Wine, for joining us and, and giving us those thoughts. Uh, thanks to all our listeners for listening in. Uh, as always, please send us your comments on this program and any suggestions you have for future programs. Uh, please subscribe to Better Peace on your podcatcher of choice. And after you have subscribed, please rate and review this podcast because that's how more people come to find out about the kinds of discussions we just have and, and to grow the community. And so until next time, uh, this is uh, Colonel J.P. Clark uh, thanking you for your attention from the War Room. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.